Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. We are glad that you are with us. We wish to welcome you to the Midweek Bible Study for the Selang Church of Christ. If you have been to our building, you know where we are. If, on the other hand, you are joining us from someplace else in the Philippines or someplace else in the world, we are located in the city of Silang, Cavite, Philippines, on Algonaldo Highway or the bypass at kilometer 42. That makes us about 30, 30 miles or 50 kilometers south of downtown Manila. We are glad that you are with us, and we hope that our study of God's Word is of benefit to you. As always, we start with a prayer request, so let's do that. Join me in prayer, please. Dear Lord, we come to you at this time with an attitude of gratitude, grateful for the things that we receive on a daily basis, asking, Lord, that you reach down upon us and help us each to grow in thy will, to be stronger servants, to be better salt, to be better light to the world that's around us. However, Lord, we do have some specific petitions that we would like to present at this time. We are presenting healing prayers from Giselle's friend who is abroad, who has recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. And Lord, we ask that she would be restored to her physical well-being. Uh, for Mary Fay, we continue to pray uh, for healing and guidance. And we ask God that we would help, that you would help her to be the person that she should be and that you would give her the guidance from your word as is always the case. Uh, we pray for Israel and healing prayer for Claudio and Rosella. We pray healing prayers for Danny and Odie and Sister Doe's mom. We pray for a peaceful and orderly election in November of this year in the U.S. We ask, Lord, that you continue to look on each of us, grant us strength, and help us grow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, today's class is going to be kind of easy for me. Uh, by the way, we do want to pray also for Anna and Mark and uh, their family on the passing of Amating. And we ask, Lord, that you will help that family to recover. Uh, open your Bibles, please, if you will. And read for me Malachi. Malachi. Actually, if you're at Matthew chapter 1, turn to page, one page to the left. And that will give you Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Read for me verse 5, please, Giselle. You're muted, Giselle. Okay, what verse, sir? Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Okay, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Remember the law of my servant, Moses, the statutes and rules that I, that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. That's not Malachi chapter ah, 4, verse okay. 5. Okay, behold, I will send you Elijah. Elijah. Eli Elijah. Elijah. Okay, Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And Katrina, verse 6, please. 6 says, He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Okay. Else I will come and strike the land with total delection. destruction. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, Cora. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Matthew 1, 1. And it says, This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Son of David, the son of Abraham. Please tell me if you will. 
How much time was between Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, and Matthew chapter 1, verse 1? You're muted, sweetheart. Malachi is the time of Elijah. In Matthew is the time of Jesus. Or started with, I guess, from Abraham. So how many years were between Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, and Matthew? Um, anybody, I don't have an, an idea, sir. There's no harm in learning, right? What's your question again, sir? How much or how many times? You're muted, sir. Thank you. How many years between Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, and Matthew chapter 1, verse 1? I, there is, I can't say any numbers here, but reading from the, from verse 6, it could be more than 100 years. It is more than 100 years. Katrina. I have no clue, brother. You have no clue. Giselle. Sir, same as Katrina said. I have no clue. 400 years. Wow. This is commonly referred to as the intertestamental period or the 400 silent years. As we get ready to launch into this broadcast, and I'm going to run over on class today, so let me apologize for that in advance. Uh, I'm going to give you a video of the inter introduction to the intertestamental period by WVBS. You guys know I like their stuff. Intertestamental period. And by the way, keep notes, guys. Can everybody This hear is it? a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Hi, my name is Daniel Cates. Together, we're going to be studying an introduction to the intertestamental period. I'll be using the King James Version of the Bible in our study together. When one is reading through his Bible, he goes from the Old Testament, reading uh, many prophecies concerning Christ and concerning the church. He goes into the New Testament, and he sees a lot of the prophecies realized. But the world of the New Testament is a completely different one than that which he had studied in the Old Testament. And the things which he had read in the Old Testament did not necessarily all see a correlation, at least not superficially, uh, in the New Testament. The things which he sees in the New Testament, including the sects of the Jews and the uh, political power that the priests had and things of that nature, simply were not seen in the Old Testament. When one looks back at his physical Bible and he sees that Old Testament and the New Testament, he may notice that there's a blank page between the two. That blank page covers maybe some 400 years. Is that history silent? Is it the case that the Bible has nothing to say concerning that period? What took place during that period? How did what took place in that period prepare for the things which are going to be introduced in the New Testament? 
Those were all questions that a study of the intertestamental period can help to answer. In our brief introduction of this study, we want to consider a couple of the prophecies of the Old Testament. There are many to which we could refer, but we'll focus on the prophecies of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 as we see what Galatians 4.4 4 speaks concerning. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. When the fullness of the time was come. That passage tells us that God had made great plans or taken great pains for Jesus Christ to come at the appropriate time. If we think about that from a human perspective, uh, we might wonder why God had not sent Jesus sooner. We may even wonder why God did not wait longer to send Jesus. If we were to picture ourselves in the position of God and we have the remedy for sin in Jesus Christ, why would we not introduce the remedy, uh, remedy as soon as the problem is discovered. That is, right after the Garden of Eden. Why would we perhaps not introduce the problem when God's covenant people begin to wander away from Him? Why would we wait till the turn of the years B.C. to A.D.? Why, why would we wait till that pivotal, uh, pivotal point in history? Well, the fullness of time and the timing in God's eyes was due to God's wanting certain things to have been accomplished before Jesus Christ entered into the world. At that time when those things which had been prophesied were accomplished, then God would send forth His Son made of a woman, that is, the product of a virgin birth, made under the law, that is, during the time when Judaism was the uh, established covenant. In Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, we see some of the elements with regard to the fullness of time. Why this had to be what we call now the, the uh, transition from B.C. to A.D. In Daniel 2, we are introduced to a problem that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar was having. He was having dreams, but he could not remember what the dreams were, and he had no idea what the dreams meant. Nebuchadnezzar went to his specialists, his Chaldeans, those who might be able to give him an idea of what he was dreaming, but they could not help at all. They couldn't tell him the meaning. In fact, they couldn't even tell him what he had dreamed. Daniel ultimately was brought in to be able to tell not only the dream, but the interpretation thereof. In Daniel 2, beginning in verse 31, we see Daniel's telling Nebuchadnezzar what he had seen. What he had seen was a great statue, a colossal image. This statue was made of various materials. The head of the statue was of gold. The breast and the arms of the statue were of silver. The belly and thighs of this colossal image were of brass. And then the legs and the feet were of iron and iron mixed with miry clay. Daniel went on to identify for Nebuchadnezzar what this dream represented. If you have your Bible, please read with me beginning in Daniel 2, 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold." And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. 
and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, forasmuch as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces, and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. We'll pause there for just a moment. But Daniel has, has identified what the elements of this colossal image represent. They represent kingdoms or kings. The first part of that statue, the head of gold, represented Babylon, and specifically King Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon was a strong kingdom for its time, but compared to the kingdoms that would follow it, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, it, it did not have a great amount of strength. However, it was a very valuable kingdom in the sight of God. In fact, that was the kingdom who had fulfilled God's purpose in taking his southern kingdom, Judah, into captivity. That was the kingdom who uh, would see the uh, continuance of this effort toward the fullness of time, and through which we would have Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, prove their faithfulness to God. One would see a king like Nebuchadnezzar, who would admit that God was indeed the God, chapters 3 and 4, and that He ruled in the kingdoms of men. So that king was valuable, even though it did not have as much strength as those that would come. Hence, we see its reference uh, to gold. Gold being valuable and yet malleable. Daniel then identified that another kingdom would follow. The breast and the arms of silver represented the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire was an empire that really was consolidated under the rule of the great king Cyrus. Cyrus had both Median and Persian blood flowing through his veins. Cyrus would be very important as a ruler because he would let God's people return from Babylonian captivity, but also in a secular sense because he had destroyed not only Babylon, but he would destroy Lydia and he would also destroy Egypt. When we get into Daniel 7, we will revisit that thought with his destruction of these three other kingdoms. Well, the next kingdom after Medo-Persian, after a series of kings uh, that were of Persian, Persian origin, was the belly and the thighs of brass. That represented Greece. Now, Greece was an extremely important kingdom, not only for Bible and uh, for the intertestamental period. Greece ref was a uh, nation so important that today we still see many products of Greece in our modern world. Well, Greece really got its start under the king named Alexander the Great. He was a Macedonian, which means he was from an area north of the Aegean Sea, but he was the son of a king of Macedonia who had united all of Greece under what was called the League of Corinth. When his father was murdered, Alexander quickly uh, consolidated all that his father had had, made sure everybody was on his side, and he promised them that they would be able to fight their perennial enemy, uh, who was uh, Medo-Persia. And Indeed, he did so, and a little bit later, we'll take a closer look 
at Greece's fight against Medo-Persia. But Alexander the Great was able to conquer a large part of the world or the world of that day. And so he was yet stronger than even the kingdom of silver, Medo-Persia. And yet as silver is less valuable than gold, so brass is less valuable than silver. This kingdom had less value in the eyes of God, but it had more strength. His kingdom would be one that as soon as, his, as soon as he died was divided into a number of different directions. Scripture is going to point out four directions. Scripture is then going to speak in great detail regarding two of those directions under which uh, Alexander's kingdom was divided. Seleucid Syria and Ptolemaic Egypt, with each of these sort of fighting against each other off and on for the next couple of hundred years after Alexander the Great's death. But with one of those in particular, Seleucid Syria, doing a great deal of harm to the children of Israel, to the Jews who, who lived in this border state between Syria and Egypt. Ultimately, Rome would enter the picture. Rome would be a nation that would conquer Syria and would conquer Egypt. Many are especially familiar with the uh, Ptolemaic queen, Cleopatra, and with her political dealings with Rome, especially with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Maybe not so much uh, familiar is the battle that Octavian Caesar had with Mark Antony and Cleopatra in 31 BC, the Battle of Actium, which battle definitely gave Rome supremacy over Egypt. Well, that established Rome as the dominant Me uh, Mediterranean sea power and Mediterranean power uh, for that matter fulfilling Daniel's conditions for this fourth kingdom, Rome. We stopped reading at verse 43. Read with me now Daniel 2, 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings, that is in the days of the Roman kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom we have a fifth kingdom being spoken of here in Daniel chapter 2. And that's an important thought as we'll notice uh, subsequently. But this fifth kingdom is not a physical kingdom. This fifth kingdom is the Lord's church. We continue in verse 44. God of heaven shall set up a, uh, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That is, this kingdom will have mastery over the kingdoms of men, over Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome. Continuing into verse 45, Forasmuch as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. We didn't mention when we mentioned the statue to begin with what we saw in verse 35. In verse 35, the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold were broken in pieces by a stone which was cut out without hands. Verse 34, that stone then filled the whole earth. That's the church. The church of the first century was the church of prophecy. In its establishment, it saw God's will being, uh, being fulfilled. Not only had this fullness of time prepared for the uh, coming of Jesus Christ, it prepared for the establishment of His church. We go into chapter 7 and we see more regarding this, these prophecies and these four kingdoms. 
In Daniel 7, verses 2 through 8, we see in this apocalyptic picture, apocalyptic writing uses imagery to be able to uh, provide meaning. Daniel, verse 2, spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. The sea in Daniel 7, 2 represents the world. The four winds of the heaven uh, help to demonstrate, number one, different directions. Number two, their striving over the sea help to demonstrate a, a tumultuous uh, condition that the sea or the world was in. And from this tumultuous sea, four beasts are going to arise. Verse 3, And the four beasts came up from the sea, diverse or different, one from another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet of a ma as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. If one will scroll down to verse 17, he will see Daniel beginning to interpret this dream indicating these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And as one goes through there, he realizes that kings is a term synonymous with kingdoms. Uh, one will notice that particularly in verse 23. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. And it's this beast which had ten horns, has horns representing ten kings, Verse 24, well, we see in this same context as Daniel chapter 2, four nations being dealt with. According to Daniel 2, 18, these concern the kingdom. These concern the church. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Well, what are these four beasts? As we saw Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome in Daniel 2, so we see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome in Daniel 7. The first of these beasts which came up from this sea, which represented the world, was a lion with eagle's wings. A lion, that, that image represents strength. That image represents kingliness. The idea that this lion had eagle's wings indicates that this lion had a fast ascent. Babylon of Daniel's day was not the Babylon which had existed years earlier. This Babylon was also a, or, or was rather a Chaldean empire. Chaldea was located to the southeast of Babylon, nearer the Persian Gulf. Well, it was from Chaldea that Nabopolassar and his descendants ultimately destroyed Babylon and settled there as their capital. This fast ascent involved helping to destroy the Assyrians in Nineveh, driving them farther to the uh, west to Haran and Carchemish, where Babylon seized ultimate control. This lion, or this uh, lion with eagle's wings, this kingly beast with great aspiration, was certainly a wonderful picture for Nebuchadnezzar. He was followed by a bear. Now we mentioned earlier that the 
kingdom of Medo-Persia, which followed Babylon, not only destroyed Babylon, but it also destroyed the kingdoms of Lydia and Egypt. A bear represents strength. This was a strong kingdom indeed. But this bear had three ribs in the mouth of it or in the teeth of it. Those three ribs represent those three conquered peoples. Those had been the prey of the bear. Babylon had been destroyed by Cyrus or taken by Cyrus. And it was from there that Cyrus issued the edict which allowed God's people to be loosed from captivity. Today we have record of that in a secular sense in the Cyrus Cylinder. One sees a scriptural record of that as he reads the very last verses of Ezra, uh, uh, or Second Chronicles rather, in the very first verses of Ezra. Well, Medo-Persia, this bear would ultimately fall to a leopard. Leopards represent speed. This leopard had fowl's wings also. That is, it had this, uh, these wings that represented a swift ascent, this aspiration to something great. That leopard represented Alexander the Great and his Greece. Now, he ultimately was followed by Rome. Rome is described here in this uh, prophecy of Daniel 7 as a diverse beast. It was a beast which had numerous characteristics. It's hard to uh, find a beast that would adequately describe what this beast was like. And this beast is spoken of as having ten horns. Well, these horns, Daniel indicated, represent kings. Depending on where one tries to, uh, tries to begin the kings that are represented by this horn, there's going to be a little horn that comes up at the, uh, at the end after these ten horns. One can see these ten horns uh, representing different possibilities as far as kings are concerned. But ultimately, three people could be considered this little horn. The reason for this is that Rome's history and its history with Judea are not necessarily always a shared history. From a popular perspective, the first Caesar is considered to have been Octavian Caesar. But by the time Octavian Caesar came around, the Romans had already had dealings with the Israelites. In fact, the Romans had had dealings with the Israelites from the time of their commander, Pompey the Great. Well, Pompey the Great never was Caesar, but he was a ruler of Rome. In fact, he was part of what was called the first triumvirate, the first rule of three, in which he ruled alongside two others. This Pompey is considered by some to have been the first of the horns. If that's the case, then counting down through history, that little horn that arose turns out to be the Roman Caesar Vespasian. Vespasian was important from a scriptural perspective. In fact, he's the one who would help to fulfill Matthew 24's prophecy concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. He was the uh, king who put down this Jewish revolt which had begun in A.D. 66. Now he had a son. His son was named Titus. Titus also bore some importance as far as the Jews uh, were concerned. Now if you look at the one who's popularly called Caesar, Julius Caesar, and you consider that he is the first of the Caesars, or the first of these horns, then the little horn would be Titus. The problem with that is that for the Jews, Julius Caesar did not play a great role. He, he did not certainly do to the Jews what 
uh, Pompey did uh, in going into the temple and so forth, offering uh, sacrifices to false gods, uh, you name it. So it's not likely that Julius Caesar is the first, although Titus would be a fitting little horn. The third possibility is the one who is the first Caesar, that is Octavian. If one considers that Octavian is the first of these horns, then the little horn that's being spoken of by Daniel is going to be the Emperor Domitian. Domitian was a terrible, terrible emperor. He proclaimed himself Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. He was a great persecutor of the early church. In fact, Irenaeus tells us that it was during Domitian's reign that John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, and it was there in the Isle of Patmos that John received the revelation. It is very likely the case that the ten horns of Daniel chapter 7 start with the, uh, Octavian Caesar, the first Caesar recognized as Augustus, the first to wear the title Imperator or Emperor, that the ten horns begin with him, and the little horn is this Domitian. That fits into the context of Daniel 7, which is a context concerning the Lord's kingdom, the Lord's church. As we look at Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, we see nations that really don't have a lot to do directly with the Old Testament and whose influence is really all that's seen in the New Testament, aside from Rome, who was still in power when the New Testament opened. But in these four nations, we see the fullness of time being prepared for. In fact, one can look at Babylon and one can consider the synagogues, which developed during the time of the Babylonian uh, captivity. When Paul would go into a new area to preach the gospel, the first place that he would go would be the synagogue. One can think about the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians had an unalterable law. When we get into the New Testament, God establishes a new system which is unalterable. The Jews would have an appreciation of that. Greece provided a common language Paul was able to go into virtually any area and speak freely in Greek because of the efforts of Alexander the Great. And then Rome provided a couple of benefits as well to the fullness of time, provided a vast road system which would make travel easy, and it also provided a peace which would allow a Roman citizen like Paul to be able to go from place to place preaching the gospel in relative security. As we study the intertestament period, we'll look more closely at the, some of the individual figures and we'll see their importance and perhaps whet our appetites for a more in-depth study of the intertestament. Thank you for listening. All right. Now we know something about the intertestamental period, don't we? All right, and we are two minutes over period, so let's stop the broadcast. Stop the recording. Where they changed my inter interface again.